Please note this webinar is being recorded. Uh, please disconnect at this time if you are not fine with this webinar being recorded. Thank you for joining us today. Um, all lines have been muted upon entry and will remain muted for the duration of the webinar. Please submit your chat questions uh, using the Q&A panel at any time throughout today's conversation. Uh, you can find all of the controls in the lower center of your screen. Please, if it is if you it is not visible, please select that icon and it'll appear on your screen in the right hand side. We ask that you submit questions to all panelists. That way we can all see it and help facilitate on your behalf. If you need to for better viewing of today's webinar, please go up to view in the upper left hand corner of your screen and hide participants without video for better viewing. With that, I will turn it over to Gila. Actually, I'm going to take step in first and welcome everyone. Good, good afternoon or good morning, um, wherever you may be. Um, I'm Cynthia Vincent. I am on the implementation science team here at the National Cancer Institute. And I want to welcome you to this second in a series of webinars that are really focusing on the consortium for cancer implementation science. So last month we heard about the past, the present and the future of the consortium. And this month we're going to be learning about work that happened um, as a result of one of the action groups from our first consortium and it's the economics of um, working group. And I'm very happy to uh, be able to turn this over to Gila Netta on our team. But I do wanna let you know that in January we will be having our third um, webinar and that will be focused on the community engagement um, action group and then we will have a fourth webinar in February focused on the technology action group. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Gila Netta. Um, so take it away, Gila. Great. Thank you so much. Um, happy to be here and happy to introduce uh, my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrea Eisman, who's an assistant professor at Wayne State University, Dr. Lisa Saldana, a research scientist at Oregon Social Learning Center, and Dr. Ramsey Saloum, associate professor at the University of Florida College of Medicine. Um, but why we have these three people here, these are uh, three of our lead investigators who are, um, who are um, leading several papers that are part of a collection uh, for this economics and implementation science work group. So as Cindy had mentioned, uh, during the first consortium meeting, the Consortium for Cancer and Implementation Science, one of the action groups, uh, which was identified as a key priority in the field, was focused on how do we measure costs in our implementation studies and conduct economic evaluations in our implementation studies. And this was recognized as a key priority area, because as you all know, cost is a key implementation outcome, but an outcome for which we um, have relatively few measures. Um, so as, I, as identified by the steering committee, this was an area that we wanted to help advance and generate some public goods. And so in that first meeting, a group of experts came together and identified that part of the challenge is having good guidance on how do we best measure costs in our implementation studies? What should we be measuring? How should we be measuring it? And understanding not just the cost of the interventions, but the cost of the strategies and methods to deliver those interventions. Um, so here we have um, Lisa Saldana has developed uh, one of the few measures we have in the field, COINS, that, that includes looking at costs. Um, and as well as Ramsey who addresses um, looking at adaptations and how do we think about the cost of adaptations and Andrea, who is focused on um, understanding when we're thinking about costs, um, what are the, what are the key pieces of information that we need to give and provide to our stakeholders and, and how that may vary depending on who your audience is. Um, I may have somewhat slaughtered points of their papers and they will do a much better job um, of describing the main points, but Essentially, these three, along with dozens of other investigators in economics and implementation science, came together to develop a collection of papers to provide this guidance to the field. Um, and not only from the consortium that NCI led, but the VA had a separate ongoing effort um, through a Slack group 
a group that um, met monthly to talk about how do we best address these challenges. And so our two groups came together to develop this set of papers, um, which uh, has, have recently been published. Um, the first two have been published are now online and the next two should be forthcoming uh, within the coming month or two. Um, and we anticipate another six to be joining them. So if you go to the CCIS website, you can see we'll be continuing to add those papers there. And there's also a link to the collection on the Implementation Science Journal. Um, so with that, I want to pass it on um, to the people who you really came to hear. Um, so Andy, Lisa, and Ramsey can talk to you briefly. I'm hoping you all can open by just talking about what was your paper topic for this collection? Why this? Um, what were some of the major take home points? And then we can go from there with a the discussion. So, and I'll go in order of those pictured on the slides. Let's start with you, Andy, if that's okay. Great. Thank you, Gila. Um, so the paper topic that we covered was multi-level stakeholder perspectives and understanding, collecting, and applying uh, implementation cost estimates. And why is this important? Well, we believe this topic is important because cost of implementation is really central to implementing and sustaining evidence-based programs and practices and really ultimately achieving our public health objectives. But one of the things that we found is that cost and benefits are not distributed evenly across stakeholder groups or levels. And this could include patients, teachers, uh, students, providers, health systems, and other organizations. And what we were exploring was, you know, when we think about these different perspectives, to really start cr critically evaluating where there's synergy, so where they align and where they diverge. Um, because that sort of synergy and divergence can have an, a real world impact on decision making around our implementation efforts. Major take home points of this paper were that implementation efforts benefit from considering multiple stakeholder perspectives. Well, this certainly is not new. In fact, the second panel on cost effectiveness in health and medicine talked about considering multiple perspectives. It's a deceptively simple statement. So one of the things that we talked about was how do we know what perspectives to include? And the short answer is the perspective of those who will be informed by our analyses. So those decision makers and stakeholders who will be using this information for our real world implementation efforts. And another take home point was that in order for us to move this for this the field forward, especially around considering multiple perspectives, we would benefit from applying our implementation science economics as well as behavioral economics frameworks to help support this integration across these various perspectives. So where divergence exists, how these theories and frameworks can help support us in simultaneously considering multiple perspectives that will both maximize benefits and minimize costs, which is our goal in economic evaluation. I just want to acknowledge that this paper was a fantastic collaborative effort with um, some economists and implementation scientists, including Andrew Kwambach, Mark Badavong, Laura Panatoni, and Russ Glasgow. And it was really about combining different areas of expertise to think about creating new pathways, new ways to apply economic evaluation to our implementation efforts. And lastly, you know, one of the real driving forces for me in, in this paper, um, and part of the reason I was so passionate about it was because, you know, working with my community partners, I really see the impact of these differ differential costs and benefits in everyday life. Um, so thinking about how we can we can bring some of this together to benefit um, our implementation efforts in communities. Great, thank you so much, Andy. Uh, Lisa, how about you next? Thanks, thank you. And so I'm gonna, um, Andy really teed me off very nicely there. Um, 
So my paper is really um, taking a step back um, for folks on the call who might be familiar with coins or the cost of implementing new strategies. Um, that is, um, it's similar to a micro approaching, uh, micro costing approach that we um, really developed um, out of one of the first um, implementation trials that was funded um, back in 2006. Um, at that time, I had the privilege of bringing um, Mark Campbell to my team, who is an economist who continues to work with me. And um, that's where we developed coins, where really what we, the point of coins was, was to try and determine what were the costs associated with completing different implementation activities, sometimes even implementation strategies that might be part of a full implementation approach to move um, interventions from the point of engaging all the way through um, implementing fully um, to competency or towards certification. And so with that, um, folks who are familiar with the SIC, that probably sounds familiar. And so what we do is we um, use the SIC activities. And then what we do is we determine what are the direct and indirect costs that are associated with completing those activities. So this is work that's been um, going on for the last decade or so, and um, various folks throughout the field have um, utilized the coins, which has been such a delight to see. But what we keep getting um, asked and what I keep getting asked is, what do we do with these numbers after we have them? Okay, so now we, we've costed this and we've determined what the cost of each of these activities are, but how do we then use that to inform an actual analysis? And so for this particular um, paper, what um, I did was really focus on what I've been hearing from qualitatively from a lot of the stakeholders that we work with in the field, those decision makers that Andy was just talking about. And so when we work with folks, you know, various interventions, different types of um, sometimes evidence-based practices, sometimes non-evidence-based practices, but really wanting to know if we determine the cost, how is that going to impact the decisions that we make? And so there are various things, first of all, in terms of the timing of when the costs occur in the implementation process for decision makers to be able to determine, to determine when and how they're going to use their resources and their money. But then also, what does this mean in terms of what they can expect? Um, not so much um, just on a return of investment, which is something that we hear about a lot, but also in terms of what is this going to mean in terms of us being able to recoup those costs that we um, that we spent on startup, or how many clients do we need to be able to serve before we are able to start realizing some of the value of what it is that we've put forward. And so this paper really was focused on trying to give some concrete sort of um, pragmatic examples of how we've utilized coins data and then feed that into um, some really basic um, economic analyses and, um, and see what we can do with it from there. So the idea is really building on those traditional analyses that we use in other settings and then bringing those into the implementation science space. Um, I had the privilege of working on this paper again with Mark Campbell, who was part of my team, and then Deb Ritzweller. And so that really allowed us to have my perspective as an implementation scientist, but then their perspective as economists. So I look forward to talking more about that. Thanks. Great, thanks, Lisa. Ramsey, can we turn it over to you? Absolutely, and thank you, Gila. So uh, our paper uh, examined how economic evaluation can accommodate the influence of adaptations, uh, whether they're planned or unplanned. And uh, I had the privilege of working with uh, Todd Wagner, um, Sarah Daniels, uh, Amanda Midbo, Andrew Klombeck, and, and David Chambers on this paper. Uh, and uh, th the reason why this is uh, so important is that there's increasing recognition uh, within healthcare settings that adaptations to either evidence-based practices uh, or implementation strategies that enhance the delivery of, of these um, uh, practices uh, in response to uh, dynamic contexts in which the programs are implemented uh, is so important. Uh, and although adaptations uh, either to evidence-based practices or implementation strategies are common uh, and ne necessary in maximizing their health impact, uh, there's been little attention that's been given to the economics of, of adaptation uh, decisions and to the methodolo uh, methodology and, and challenges uh, in, in those methodologies for evaluating the economic implications of adaptations. Uh, that that often occur in the implementation process, and and personally, I've been interested in the link between uh, costs and uh, and program sustainability, 
Uh, and so I, I think about uh, the uh, dynamic sustainability frame, framework um, that, that David uh, Chambers and, and others introduced a few years ago. Uh, and, and so how, um, how these uh, telling the story about adaptations uh, is incomplete without considering uh, economic costs and, and being able to make that link between uh, the adaptations that occur in order for uh, sustainability to happen uh, and and telling uh, and being able to learn from an implementation experience in, in one setting and and transferring that into uh, into another setting uh, it's really key to have uh, information about uh, the economic implications of the adaptations that happen so uh, so major take home points uh, were, uh, basically, that we've uh, recognized that um, uh, adaptations can happen either in a in a planned or unplanned fashion, uh, and uh, adaptations uh, could occur to the evidence based practices or the implementation strategies themselves. And all of these scenarios have economic implications. Uh, while there are challenges to capturing the the uh, costs and economic implications of these adaptations. There are existing frameworks that can help us in the process. So, for example, uh, the uh, the frame instrument that uh, that Shannon uh, uh, Sturman and and colleagues introduced to uh, to measure adaptations can be also useful uh, to to capture the economic uh, implications of, of adaptations. So we talk about that considering the different um, uh, domains of, of the frame, such as the timing of, of the adaptation, the decision maker, the uh, uh, the delivery level, all of these domains have economic implications. Uh, and then we get into the um, approaches that can be used um, uh, beyond capturing the context through something like the frame where we could use qualitative methods or mixed methods, which which may be what we really need to understand uh, around the uh, adaptation decision is this sort of the context that happened then. Uh, beyond that, we uh, we think about uh, planned adaptations and uh, the economic uh, methods that allow for marginal estimates across adaptations. Uh, however, tracking downstream effects of, of planned adaptations may be problematic and, and subject to confounding. Um, and uh, the bigger challenge is being able to uh, estimate the, the marginal costs in the case of when we have unplanned or reactive adaptations. Uh, that's going to be more challenging because unplanned adaptations create noise that could limit the interpretation or reduce the, the statistical power of, of such estimations. Great. Thank you, Ramsey. So. You all sort of touched on this point a little bit, um, but really getting down to what I think uh, maybe a lot of folks in the audience want to know is, what do you see as the key value of measuring implementation costs and what exactly should we be measuring and for whom? And, um, you know, however, whoever and however you want to answer it, you can just chime in. Well, I guess I can start and I can say in terms of the value, and then I think Andy is probably the one best to talk about the who, um, but the value of it um, from the perspective that I see just from talking to, again, so many different decision makers, and by that I mean a wide range of decision makers. Some are like executive directors of clinics, some are, you know, big um, hospital execs, but then other folks are, um, you know, program managers over smaller, smaller programs, some are over large programs, some are over, over um, small programs. And so really being able to identify what the resource needs are for an implementation and what it is that they will get back. And so what I mean by that is that so often when we talk to different decision makers, again, um, my colleague Mark Campbell and I have done a number of qualitative interviews and we hear repeatedly from decision makers that they feel caught off guard. So um, they, they buy an intervention or they buy a device, they buy something that they think is going to be a solution to a problem they've identified. But what is not part of that is a real understanding of what is it going to take to implement that thing that they bought. 
And so um, sometimes um, folks are feeling a little bit um, hoodwinked or a little bit like there was a bait and switch that happened. And so being able to really to inform fully what is needed um, and the expectations to be able to implement um, personally, I feel like would um, help make great big advances in terms of having folks trust what it is that we are putting out there and really helping them know um, that when they are making that decision to implement that they are fully prepared to be able to do so effectively. Yeah, Lisa, one of the things that you mentioned that I really appreciated was this idea of transparency. And I think that that, you know, extends to when we start thinking about um, what we're measuring and for whom um, to get at some of those, those surprises, as you mentioned, when, when uh, organizations are moving to implement, you know, specific evidence-based interventions. Um, because, you know, although traditionally, and it's not in any way to, to say that the um, societal perspective is not important because it is, and it has many benefits, um, at the same time, there's a level of aggregation of what costs and benefits are to different stakeholders and decision makers. And in that way, the decision makers and stakeholders don't necessarily know what an implementation effort will cost them. You know, in their organization, in their setting, what are the benefits um, and what are the you know costs or the expenses uh, of implementing and sustaining a specific evidence-based uh, practice. And, you know, as I mentioned briefly, you know, the pragmatic of what perspectives we need to include are those who's, um, who's, who will be informed by our analyses because the perspectives that we adopt inherently place value on what costs are measured and thus prioritize when we are um, costing out implementation strategies or really implementation efforts uh, more broadly. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons in the paper we talk about the need to, to adopt a multi-level stakeholder perspectives. And we talk a little bit about what are some potential priorities for each group, although this is still very much in development. I think that's one of the really interesting and exciting things about where we are now is starting to think about that disaggregation, starting to think about where there is synergy, where there is divergence, and how we can start to bring them together. And I'll just mention briefly, I'm probably going on to, to you know, one of our, our next topics, but thinking about you know, mixed methods, thinking about bottom-up um, approaches to costing so that we can get ideas from our stakeholders what their priorities are. Um, and when we engage in implementation efforts, you know, what are some of the costs to them, including unanticipated costs, which might transition sort of nicely to, to Ramsey about, you know, in terms of planned and unplanned um, adaptations. I guess I'll add here um, about a, a basic notion in, in economics, and that's a notion of opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is the value of, of using the resources uh, that we have for, for the next best alternative. And you think about uh, resource-constrained organizations making decisions about, uh, about implementation. So it's, it's really uh, thinking about capturing the opportunity cost uh, for, for that organization. Um, and um, and Todd Wagner has a really nice uh, piece that uh, was recently published in uh, the journal for uh, Journal of General Internal Medicine about um, thinking about measuring costs for implementation research. Uh, and um, and and so basically, uh, we we don't have talks about the fact that we don't have a database of, of opportunity costs out there. We we have to use existing sources to uh, to estimate. Uh, what our opportunity cost is, and and uh, the the best the next best thing to doing that is probably using activity based costing because it um, uh, provides more uh, more uh, more precision in, in the estimates. Uh, uh, sometimes that's not possible. We have to use uh, claims based measures or uh, payments or, or charges that uh, the organization has available to us as as proxy uh, as proxies, which is not. Um, uh, which isn't going to be ideal, but going back to uh, activity-based costing, uh, it uh, might be our, our best alternative because it uh, allows us to track inputs um, and um, such as labor, supplies, and space. 
uses accounting rules to uh, uh, designate, uh, to, to estimate uh, healthcare systems costs of producing the care. So that's why it's, uh, it's sort of uh, a, a good way to, to measure costs. Uh, and then we think about um, uh, whether it's relevant to measure fixed costs and variable costs to inform the decisions that we're making. Uh, and despite um, uh, these, these strengths that uh, activity-based costing allows us to, to have, uh, one challenge, one key challenge is that it's, it's specific to that organization, and then there are challenges in generalizing the findings to other uh, healthcare systems. Great. As a, as a follow up to that, um, we have a question from the audience that's um, specifically asking Ramsey, but I think um, any of you should feel free to weigh in on this. How close in time do you feel adaptations need to be assessed compared to when they occur, realistically, given usual time and burden requirements? <laughs> and again, I think this depends on. Uh... The way that you, the resources that you have uh, available and the method that you're using to, uh, to capture the data. I mean, that's something that uh, is uh, often exogenous and um, out, out of your control. So, uh, ideally, um, uh, if, if you're using uh, an activity based uh, costing method, you're able to, uh, uh, to capture costs. Um, uh, proactively, um, and uh, if you are proactive about uh, measuring adaptations, you can uh, you can use an ABC approach where you can tease out the uh, the costs related to to adaptations during that process uh, by um, by first uh, capturing all the activities that are occurring in the log, and then uh, and then looking at all the the different uh, Types of staff and, and roles that you have in, in the implementation process to make sure that you're not missing any any data in the logs. And then, if so, if you're missing data, try to deal with with the missing data that you have up front. Uh, and then teasing out uh, what uh, activities or what portions of activities are associated with uh, are actually part of the adaptations that are occurring. And then. Uh, and then also being able to capture the, um, the net uh, impact of, of the adaptations on uh, the cost of the intervention itself or uh, the cost of the implementation strategy. So I think that this can be done uh, proactively using uh, activity-based costing if, if that's something that is, if you have the resources to do, to do that. Gila, if I might just add to that too, I think from a different perspective, I love what you just said, Ramsey, and I also think um, part of it is dependent on what it is that it, we're trying to. So there's the costing of the activities, as was just described, but then what's the outcome? So if we're trying to actually um, do some sort of an analysis, then wanting to understand it, are we looking at a change in reach because of um, because of the adaptation? Are we looking at some change in pacing of uptake? Whatever that might happen to me might also influence um, when in that process folks would want to um, conduct that, that um, costing approach. Great. So along those lines, um, I'm curious, what are some of the major challenges you've faced in measuring and analyzing implementation costs? Um, and also, more generally, what do you think of we need to improve or conduct economic evaluations in our studies. So I guess it's sort of um, two questions that are essentially the same, two sides of the same question. So I can I can start. Um, to, I mean, two uh, two general uh, general uh, challenges in in doing costing work, especially in. Uh, implementation studies are to uh, identify the uh, applicability uh, of of costs when you're uh, measuring them, uh, and then also the time horizon. And these are um, uh, things issues that are mentioned in the uh, in the um, recommendations from the uh, cost effectiveness uh, panel. Um, with respect to ap applicability, we're talking about whether the costs are an accurate reflection of um, 
uh, that the healthcare system in the healthcare system that's being studied. Um, so knowing what what uh, costs to include and exclude is not is not an easy task, um, and and making sure that uh, the costs that you're measuring apply um, uh, to the healthcare system. So for example, if you're conducting your implementation in an academic health center, it may be, uh, and you have costs from a community setting available to you from a community hospital, then uh, you want to think about whether those costs, using those costs as inputs, uh, is applicable uh, in your case. Um, uh, and then the issue of the time horizon, uh, where we want to make sure that we're dis uh, distinguishing between variable costs and fixed costs, and whether uh, the fixed costs should be included in the analysis. Oftentimes, the decision maker in an implementation setting uh, is concerned more uh, with a short time horizon. Uh, and so, uh, uh, so the variable costs are more important because those are things that can be uh, adjusted in, in the short term, whereas your fixed costs are, are fixed. Uh, and so even if you have an intervention where you're able to, uh, to uh, produce empty, uh, empty beds in a hospital, uh, that's not something that's going to translate into savings in the short run because it's, uh, these are uh, typically fixed costs. So understanding the, uh, what time horizon you're looking at for the decision maker is something that's uh, really uh, key in, in an implementation economic evaluation study. And I would say I, I absolutely agree with that. I um, I also think that um, one of the biggest challenges is probably something that most people, if you're if you're on this call, that you've experienced yourself, which is I'm um, really disentangling the intervention from the implementation costs. And so, um, particularly for some of our complex interventions, um, there are expectations that there are implementation strategies that are utilized. So, for instance, maybe a coaching model or some sort of a fidelity feedback loop that is expected. Those are, in fact, implementation costs, but if they are already part of what the um, consumer is purchasing from part of the intervention, then um, wanting to make sure that we aren't double um, sort of like, um, you know, Double costing um, particular um, activities so that we're not over inflating the cost of implementing the intervention, but then also the, you know, the exact opposite, not underestimating by assuming that some of those costs um, are ones that come with the intervention. And so for us, I think that that's 1 of the biggest challenges and ones that we hear quite often a lot from um, the folks that we work with that we consult with. Yeah, I'll add a couple more, a couple more challenges. You know, Ramsey had mentioned time horizon, and and I work in prevention, and so often our you know desired outcomes are more distal and diffuse. So, you know, inherently that does bring some challenges when we talk about time horizons and and you know how we're going to handle those in the, in our analyses. And I think also from a really practical perspective. Um, you know, the costing that I do mostly is is really an adaptation of Lisa's coins model and you know when engaging in micro costing you know it's it's potentially a, a burdensome task um, when we think about different activities so it's really identifying you know it's prioritizing and identifying those activities which are most likely to have the greatest impact on costs of you know there's a there's a give and a take in terms of precision um, and so when we're thinking about it you know prospectively what are those activities that are most likely to have the biggest impact um, on, uh, on not just costs, but, you know, when we get into our comparative economic evaluation. So I think that's that balance of, you know, the burden that we're placing on our community partners um, for tracking their costs, but also getting sufficiently precise cost estimates in order to uh, inform such decisions. And I think the other thing for me is, you know, thinking about balancing that societal perspective, which in many ways is important and I think is valuable in terms of uh, demonstrating the value of our efforts, you know, on a, on a larger scale and compared to other health economics and, and uh, economics and education, but then also retaining, you know, an emphasis on local economic considerations that really do impact implementation um, on the ground. Um, for our stakeholders, so you know those are those are definitely um, you know some of the challenges that that I've had um, in engaging in this work. 
And if I could just add, you just made me think of something, Andy, which is that um, in particular, the work that my team and I have done have, has really focused so far in those implementation phases that are before sustainment. And so I think when we get into the sustainment phase, there are a whole other host of challenges. Um, again, I think all of the things that we've already talked about um, are present there, but then probably even more um, sort of uh, challenging, robust in, um, in how they influence the decisions that we make for the directions that we're gonna go with our analyses. And so I think that is just something that I, I anticipate is going to cause um, um, further challenge, but I also think is really, really exciting to think about how we can start costing sustainment and the activities that are associated with, um, I guess, different types of sustainment, right? Like we've got the sustainment that sustained for a certain number of years, and then we have those long-term sustainers. And I suspect that the costs associated with those activities is going to vary pretty greatly. I wanted to also talk about something else that uh, <laughs> Uh, that that isn't uh, often discussed in um, uh, in economic evaluation, uh, specifically in implementation, and that's the uh, issue of efficiency. So when we take something from a controlled environment, we assume that um, we are operating at an efficient level, and then we go into the real world with an implementation study, uh, and and we we still make the assumption that we are operating at 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 efficiency uh and that's uh something that uh, uh often may not be true however it's it's this is really challenging because we can't really uh typically we can't observe efficiency uh in in the measures that we collect um so there's the notion of um uh, technical efficiency which is uh, how uh, a a producer or uh, a an organization is is converting inputs into outputs and and maximizing the amount of outputs that we're getting from a, a given set of inputs. Uh, that's something that we usually uh, are uh, unable to observe uh, in in reality very well. Uh, we have uh, the other side of efficiency is uh, allocated efficiency, which is um, something that is addressed in in cost effectiveness analysis where um, where we're looking at uh, how uh, whether the uh, what we're producing in, in a given healthcare market is is optimizing the needs of a market. So usually we're concerned about that question in, in a cost effectiveness analysis study, but we're uh, assuming that we have uh, we're operating at technical efficiency, and and that's not usually always the case, and especially in, in healthcare markets, which are. Uh, in with with an economic uh, within an economic definition, they're they're not uh, um, efficient. Or they're not perfectly competitive. So we have there is room for inefficiencies in healthcare markets, and and so addressing that uh, becomes important. There are ways to try to measure efficiency using um, uh, data and development analysis, stochastic frontier analysis methods that. Uh, uh, would be uh, interesting to uh, to see uh, more studies in within implementation science uh, using such approaches. Yeah, and then that also makes me think, Ramsey. So this is really interesting to me um, because when I think about efficiency, I think about efficiency um, for whom, and then um, you know. So again, sort of to Andy's point, but then. Figuring out. So, 1 of the things that we've been able to do with the coins work is be able to look at. So, what are the person hours required to complete a task versus what are the dollars associated with completing that? And so, um, when it comes to this idea of efficiency, I feel like there might be not always, but there might be some opportunities where there are trade offs and that allows um, different. Um, implementers to make some decisions about do we want to be more efficient with our time versus are we going to be more efficient with our money and obviously the best is when those two things can happen together but um, we all know the messiness of implementation work and that um, that's very oftentimes is not the case and so i really appreciate that perspective that you've just provided in terms of efficiency but then i would also challenge us to think about um, who is it that we're talking about and what part of that implementation process are we talking about and being open to the idea that what might be efficient for one part of the process is not going to be the decision that we would make for efficiency for another part of um, the process. Great points. 
We um, we do have some more questions from the audience. So um, next question, what are the panelists thoughts on using economic versus accounting costs for costing implementation studies? I think by that they probably mean costing implementation strategies is, is my guess. So maybe I can I can start again. So this is where um, I was talking about the uh, you know the notion of opportunity cost and thinking about opportunity cost. So it's really important to, uh, and naturally as an economist, I think it's important to have that to bring that economic perspective um, uh, versus um, thinking about uh, where anytime we're presented with a with a costing study, we're naturally inclined to think about. Um, taking an accounting approach and, and trying to capture all the costs that uh, uh, that we see in front of us. However, uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, some of these costs may not be relevant uh, to uh, that that are readily available may not be relevant to the decision maker. So thinking about uh, certain fixed costs for decision makers who are um, concerned with the short run, for example, um, uh, the cost of of uh, the space that we're operating in may not be necessarily uh, something that's relevant to the decision because that space is already uh, is is already there and is not going to change in the short run. So that's an account example of an accounting cost that may not be relevant to an economic decision. And I think I just want to build on this question because I think a question that often come comes up in a lot of conversations is. Um, and it's related, I think, to this question is when do you actually need an economist on your team? What's the degree of economic training you need for doing this type of analyses in our studies? So I think that's a really good question. Um, and I, I agree, this is one that we hear a lot. Um, uh, Maya Barnett wrote a paper that um, that focused a little bit on this topic in terms of um, being able to to really understand uh, the difference between different types of of um, economists and when to bring different economists in and um, and how and how to sort of do that team science um, amongst um, different um, interdisciplinary uh, investigators, economists being one of them. Um, I think it's tricky. I, I think, you know, I'm not an economist and, um, and I absolutely feel like um, we really, really benefit from having one on our team. On the other hand, once we've sort of learned methods and there are these standardized procedures and something where we can protocolize them, then at that point, is that necessary to have an economist? I don't, I mean, I don't feel like I personally can answer that for everybody's um, individual project. I think probably what you want to do with that data um, will influence who you want to bring in in terms of the types of analyses that you want to engage in. Um, but again, I myself not being an economist, um, I feel like there's so many economic analyses out there that um, we are still learning to be able to take advantage of in implementation science. And so I, I also definitely would not want to um, dissuade us from, from bringing in um, the card carrying economists when we can, so. Yeah, I see, uh, you know, it's a, this is such an amazing opportunity, I think, to build a bridge um, between, you know, the field of economics and, and everything that's been done and, and applying it in a practical way, you know, as we like to do in implementation science. And as Lisa said, I'm not an economist. I certainly can't answer that question, but I think the idea of developing tools that can be you know, applied pragmatically in communities to develop some cost estimates. You know, there's, there's different levels of complexity and precision that may be needed and or um, desired, you know, as we embark on various uh, cost analyses and economic evaluations. And, you know, I, for one, have learned a tremendous amount from the economists that the various economists that I've 
you know, worked with. And I think, you know, some of the foundational work that in these tools, as she mentioned, you know, protocolizing, standardizing that we can begin to develop so that, you know, when we do work with our um, economist colleagues and we are in need of more complex analyses, you know, that's where their expertise can can really be utilized in helping us develop, you know, some of these tools so that, that they can be used across uh, disciplines. And I, I also wanted to put in a plug for uh, for Mia Barnett's uh, paper, and, and Lisa is, is one of the uh, co-authors on that paper in Implementation Science Communications and was recently published. I think uh, it's it's really nice qualitative paper that takes a deeper dive into that relationship between implementation scientists and economists. And I think more importantly, uh, more important than the question of whether and, and how much uh, effort to include an economist on a study for, I think um, uh, what the my takeaway from reading that paper is that you, if you are going to be doing any economic evaluation and implementation science to foster that collaboration with uh, with your economist colleague, because um, oftentimes um, if it's someone who hasn't worked in implementation science before, uh, you you have to uh, uh, also um, recognize that they're coming from a different perspective that. Um, uh, the type of economic evaluation that they're doing doesn't consider uh, contextual factors that we think about in implementation science, um, some of the other nuances. So it's uh, uh, so it's really important to foster that collaboration with uh, any with the economist uh, that you're working with, uh, and recognize um, and educate them about um, implementation science when you're working. With them. And I would and I would also just add to that and vice versa. And then for us to be able to learn from them what it is that um, where where there is some shared visioning and where there isn't, um, what can we do to sort of modify and adjust our perspective or what it is that we're thinking about um, to also make it valuable and um, interesting and motivating um, to them as as being partners on our teams. Yeah, and I think one additional point that Maya has raised in various conversations is is not, you know, is is to practice what we preach as implementation scientists and thinking about stakeholder engagement. That when you want to work with an economist, it's not okay. My third aim is going to be measuring costs or cost effectiveness analysis. Let's bring this economist on board, but really working with economists at the get go to understand well what really are the critical. Um, questions we should be asking here related to conducting economic evaluations. What what should we be looking at and, and building that aim together? Uh, and it doesn't have to be the third aim, nor should it be necessarily depending on the goals of the research project. Um, one so, and just to interrupt real quick, just to tell you that quote got taken out of the manuscript. Unfortunately, the 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 will you help me with my third aim? So. Oh. I, <laughs> but yeah, that's definitely what that paper is about. Yeah. Great. So another um, another question uh, we have from the audience is um, back to the conversation about efficiency. Uh, can you differentiate efficiency from fidelity? And I think and and that's um, I think that's probably just for the um, I'm guessing this is a question from somebody without economics training. So just understanding what is that concept of efficiency? What are we talking about there? And 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 how is that different from fidelity? Yeah, Ramsey, I don't know if you want to give um, a, a probably a more articulate uh, response around efficiency, but um, I, there, and then I can maybe help distinguish it from fidelity or together we can. I mean, I, um, so I, I think that, I mean, it's, it's approaching it from two different perspectives and there's a uh, Potentially a lot of overlap between efficiency and, and fidelity, although I think um, with with, for example, with fidelity, there are other dimensions that uh, fall under um, that could be measures of fidelity. 
um, besides what we we observe in the in the production function. So efficiency is really um, I'm referring uh, specifically to technical efficiency. We're thinking about the production function itself. Um, are we maximizing the um, amount of outputs produced given a a constrained amount of inputs that we have available? Um, and fidelity is, I, I think, is, is broader. I see it as broader than that. Um, fidelity starts with uh, the the exploration and planning phases of implementation. It's uh, part of it is how well uh, the implementers and, and and perhaps the staff uh, are are trained to deliver the intervention, uh, and um, and so that could influence. Again, this could influence uh, efficiency if if we don't have um, uh, uh, staff who are well uh, trained uh, to deliver the intervention. So that they are very closely tied, but I think fidelity is uh, is sort of. Uh, broad, it's, it includes other uh, outcomes within it, um, and efficiency is uh, focused um, on narrowly on on the uh, the uh, output that's produced relative to inputs. Yeah, I agree, and I would just say that also with fidelity, fidelity obviously we're looking at at doing the thing, so the adherent side of things, so making sure that we're that we're checking all the boxes, but then that we're doing those boxes well. And so those activities, we want to make sure that we're doing them competently in order to be able to say that we're doing it with fidelity. Of course, um, high fidelity would be being able to do those things efficiently. However, um, high fidelity also might mean recognizing the environment, the context, um, the situation um, that you're trying to implement in and pivoting to what might appear to be a less efficient strategy at a different point in time throughout the process, depending on sort of what is coming at you in that implementation. And so similar to Ramsey's point, I do think that they are interrelated, but I also think that what your what you're looking at, sort of the lens um, through through which you're sort of making your decisions on how you're going to proceed in that implementation process um, might be different if you're considering efficiency versus going for um, strong high fidelity. I don't know, Andy, if you have other perspectives on that from the work that you've done. You know, I, the one thing I thought of as, as Ramsey was talking was, um, was the idea of, you know, when we talk about the production function, when we think about efficiency, you know, what does it take in order to achieve our specific implementation objectives? And I'm thinking of implementation outcomes, you know, such as fidelity or a dimension of fidelity. So, you know, perhaps if we're less efficient, um, it's going to require more in the way of resources to achieve a certain level of or a desired level of you know, fidelity, whether it be adherence or quality delivery. Um, so that, you know, might be another way to think about it when we think about our outcomes and what are our key outcomes. Um, you know, that could be another way that that efficiency and fidelity are interrelated. Another thing that I'll add about efficiency is that it's, it's fundamental to uh, implementation science because the uh, the reason for us uh, using and applying implementation strategies is that we are uh, dealing, uh, starting out by dealing with an inefficiency in in the healthcare system, and we're uh, working to uh, to address that inefficiency by applying implementation strategies strategies to sort of um, to optimize the uh, implementation of uh, of an intervention or an evidence based practice. So it's it's fundamental. Efficiency is fundamental to, to implementation science, and then obviously fidelity is is uh, really important in guiding uh, how well we're doing uh, in the implementation process. Great, thank you, thank you. We um, just in the last few minutes we have. There's um, one one other question here from the audience. Um, that I think might might be a nice way to close. So given the interdisciplinary nature of this work, 
How do you think the field is doing in building those collaborations to conduct economic evaluations within implementation studies? So I'll just say I I believe that the, this collection of of papers and the work group really um, reflects uh, some of that collaboration, some of that interdisciplinary and team work. Um, you know, bringing these these all of these different varying concepts together. Um, and I can speak, you know, at least for the for you know the papers that I've read and the papers that I've participated in. I think. Um, it's really helped us think critically about how we're applying economic concepts um, to advance you know, implementation efforts, um, the, you know, determining the value for our implementation efforts and really you know, making the business case, for example, for implementation strategies. And I'll, I'll just add by um, also um, recognizing the, the, the huge effort that um, you, Gila, and, and uh, the other leaders of, of the working group, uh, uh, Heather Tappet-Gold and, and, uh, and Todd Wagner, uh, have, have done here to uh, not only uh, uh, energize us and, and, and really um, uh, come up with this really nice collection of papers, but also there are, uh, I feel like this has also spurred a, um, a proliferation of, of work in, in the economics uh, of implementation over the past uh, few years. Uh, and, uh, and so we're seeing more and more uh, work out there. There's also a lot of protocol papers that are also really useful. Uh, in terms of looking at uh, real world examples of, of applying economics of um, economic evaluation implementation science. And as, as, uh, as Andy uh, mentioned, I think uh, more importantly, uh, starting to think about uh, not only capturing the cost of, of implementation, but thinking of more about the, taking the decision makers perspective, thinking about the business case. Uh, what it's going to take to sustain these uh, implementation efforts um, uh, with specifically within this collection. Uh, Alex, Dov, and colleagues have a, have a really important paper that talks about uh, uh, financing strategies and, and thinking about um, the economic evaluation uh, implications within um, uh, developing and implementing financing strategies is, is a really important paper that's uh, already been published and I, I invite you to to also review. And I can't add much more. I think that that was excellent. Um, I, I absolutely think that this work by the CCIS is, is helping us um, and um, just sort of setting the platform from folks, making it more welcoming. And I think also um, we are doing a better job at um, at not being so scared of each other's disciplines and each other's fields. And as we do that, um, I am very hopeful that we are gonna continue um, to, to really take this work forward. But I really thank you. I think um, NCI and, and you guys for putting this together. I think this is an excellent step forward. Well, that's a great way to close, Lisa. And thank you so much, Andy and Ramsey and Lisa, for um, joining us today. I did put a link um, in the chat to the collection that also um, includes the paper that Ramsey alluded to by Alex Stop, as well as Andy's paper. So um, encourage folks to look there. And um, yeah, I thank you again so much for this conversation. And uh, if you all have follow up questions, feel free to reach out and if you're interested in joining the group, they meet monthly and um, are continuing to explore relevant topics. So great to see everyone and uh, happy holidays to everybody as you're entering the continued holiday seasons. Thank you everyone. You can please disconnect at this time.